Hey there, hey there everyone. We are back and joining you. Hoping uh, this week has treated you well. We've had lots of nice weather here. So I am just waiting for Amy to pop on here. Hopefully she'll be on here soon. And there's Suzanne. Hey Suzanne, I'm so glad you're here. I am, ah, um, oh, there we go. There's Amy. Bad. I almost hit the button finish. Yikes. <laughs> hey. I almost hit the button finish. I was like, what? <laughs> Yikes. Don't want to do that. So, <laughs> no. No, no, no. So Suzanne's on here. All right. Hello. So, oh. Excited about that. What's up? I said hello, hello. Hello. Let's see who else hops on here. Um, I am like Kimmy. Yay, Kim is on here. Awesome. I miss you, girl. How is everybody doing tonight? Who has nice weather where they are? Oh, it was beautiful today. <laughs> Was it? Yeah. Because I know what you have comes to me two days later, right? Yep. It's on its way for you tomorrow. Because <laughs> we had a nice well, we, day too. Today was a nice day. I will say that. It really was. So I'm happy about that. But uh, it's been cold here. It's supposed to rain in the morning, but then warm up. I was scheduled to do some mulching at my mom's. And then I got out of it. And then she tried to tell me that it was going to stop raining at 10. And I was like, oh, well, I'm going to be, be wet. Like, yeah, it's still going to be too wet. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, well, we can go ahead and get started. Yep. And people can join us as they can. And, you know, Lori. earlier this week, oh, hey, Lori, earlier this week, um, you know, as he often does, uh, God dropped uh, Nehemiah 810 and the joy of the Lord in both of our spirits and um, kind of at different times and having no idea that um, he had done it to the other person um, when we came across it. So it brought us into a discussion of experiencing God's joy, even in some of the worst, circ worst circumstances or, or journeys that we go through in life. And so we wanted to talk about that tonight and, um, and different perspectives, um, biblical ones, and then our own from, you know, um, our own walks and uh, see what you guys have to say on here. So if you want to start out, Amy, there with uh, sure. your first revelation. Yeah, um, it was a while back, um, I don't know, several days ago when I just kept hearing the joy of the Lord is my strength. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and I needed some revelation, too. I mean, it, it's like you can receive that in your walk, but sometimes we don't have a revelation of it. Yay, and, um, hey, Sarah. And so I just kind of started asking um, the Lord, what, what revelation do I need to receive out of this? And um, I think I've shared before, he's had me in First and Second Samuel, like, a lot. And... Of course, once again, he, he put me into, um, <laughs> yay, <laughs> um, he put me in 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 4. Actually, I started off in 2 Samuel, and then he had me backtrack. And in 2 Samuel 30, verse 4, um, I'm going to flip there really quick, um, because this is when the Amalekites go in and they take, um, they basically raided uh, uh, Negev and, and Ziklag. So David and his guys um, get back and everything they have is gone, right? All their, their wives, their children, everything. And the, and the part that stuck out to me was verse four. And it says, so David and his men wept aloud until they had no strength left to weep. And I just sat back and I said, yeah, I've experienced that. 
um, multiple times in <laughs> life. And, and it just, I just kind of soaked on that for a little bit because he walked me back through um, each of those moments where I wept until I, until I had no strength left. And, mm -hmm. and I think in order to have a revelation of God and who he is and the joy, the pure joy that he can inject into your life, um, it usually comes in those moments where you have no strength left in, in your, in your heartbreak and your sadness and your grief and your brokenness, all of this stuff. Um, and then as you read on, um, so they have no strength and yet they know they have to go catch the Amalekites who just took all this stuff, right? Took all their family and all this stuff. And so you go into verse, um, verse six, but I love the, the buts because it's always, but God, you know, David found strength in the Lord. And so the Lord gave him strength in the midst of his heartbreak and in that strength gave him victory. And then after that strength and victory, I think that they had joy kind of injected into them, kind of like that second wind that we kind of talk about sometimes. Then they were able to receive yeah. everything that was told that was stolen from them. Not a single thing was missing. So you have right. your grief, your brokenness, then you have strength given to you. And in that strength comes joy and victory. And, and then, of course, the restoration. And I just think when you look at these things, you, you gain this revelation of, of who God is. And that revelation, like, shifts things. And a part of that shifting is mm. what I call, like, that side effect. The side effect of that revelation is joy. It's not like you're experiencing this happy moment. It's this, you know, like, for example, like in the midst of my heartbreaking grief, like just over the loss of my mom, that was just devastating for my entire family. There was one day that came, even though I was mad at God, I totally blamed him for her dying. Yeah, you know, I'll just be real with you. Um, even in my anger with him there was a day that came where I felt joy and peace and I couldn't explain it because I was still heartbroken but he injected yeah. that into me and that helped me kind of start crawling out of that hole and that was like the joy that became my strength to to find a way out of that that sadness and out of that pain I mean it was still there mm -hmm. it was you know it was like a slow um I'll take this small piece of your grief and I'm going to give you this small piece of joy. And he started to rebalance it by, you know what I'm saying? Well, don't you think, did you experience it like I did, like with my dad, um, where there were little, just as my Christian therapist at the time said to me, like little love notes where, you know, to that kind of induce that joy to us because little things would happen that would just give us the hope you know, of someday seeing our loved one again, you know, there was just those little things that would come up that would, that would instill that hope in us. Um, I just, for you me, know, that those were like delayed. little seeds of what's that? I said, for me, it was delayed. Like, I don't think I started experiencing that, um, for, for a few years. Um, oh, okay. a lot of other stuff that happened after my mom, um, passed away. But, you know, once I, I mean, it was just kind of like, I was a bit of a mess. I felt like a bomb that it had gone yeah. off and I couldn't get any pieces put back together. Like I just felt very unrecognizable and my life felt very unrecognizable. Um, so, you know, you just, I was just, I spent several years just trying to like function and breathe and, and do this whole thing called normal life. And, you know, yeah. I'm calling it, this is the new normal. This is new normal. I'm like, well, I don't care about it. I didn't ask for this new normal. I don't want it. I don't like it. I mean, I was, you know, I was really angry. Um, but after when it was very upside down time down, um, 
then I started seeing those things. I started seeing, you know, I, I, the Lord kind of brought revelation to me about the whole situation in the midst of that. And I, you know, he just, he communicates to us in a way that we need to hear. And I didn't realize I was hearing from him because I was still not talking to him. Um, right. But he did, he did start injecting that, that joy and that hope of the future. Um, into my life and, and understanding that situation. And, um, yeah, it was, it was not a good time, Sarah. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, losing a parent it, at any time in your life is never a good time. It's always too soon. So if you lose them, you know, I was 31 when my mom passed away, she was only 55. That was way too soon. And, um, and, you know, and I know people who have lost their parents and their parents were, you know, almost a hundred and it was still too soon. Um, it, it's just never easy. Um, but yeah, it, it was very dark, but the Lord is gracious and understanding, um, with all of our humanness, you know, and, and he always seeks you out. He always pursues you, even when you're ignoring him, like I was. Um, because I full on blamed him for everything. Cause in my mind, she was like the woman of faith, you know, she was steadfast and wise and, you know, she had all of this, you know, stuff. I'm like, if she, if anybody's going to get healed miraculously, it's going to be her. And she was healed miraculously, but I didn't like how she was healed, you know, and there's just some truth to that. And, um, and it's harsh and it's, and it's raw and, um, but that's life. Um, but the Lord does find a way to, um, to inject his miraculous joy in a way that kind of caught me off guard a lot of times. Yeah. Um, but it was good. Like I needed it, like I needed it more than I thought I needed it. Like I was really drifting off to a really dark place and, and I did, I was just in a very, very dark place. And, and so as I was thinking about all of this and how it's contagious, like our joy, once we get this revelation, it becomes a contagious thing. Like, because whether you acknowledge it or not, people are watching you. And, and so the Lord took me, flipping me back over to um, 2 Samuel um, chapter 6, verse 16. And I love this. It, so I'm just going to read the verse to you real quick. As the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michael, daughter of Saul, watched from a window. And when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. And, um, you know, I, there are times when we have this joy injection that it can't help but burst forth. And the people yeah. that are watching may not understand that. And a lot of their understanding becomes because they don't understand where you came from. You know, David came from a place of battle, of losing his possessions of, you know, I, I mean, he had a revelation because of his relationship with God too. There, that was a big part of it. And, um, and so as you do this, you know, the others, you know, they're going to despise you. Um, but they're going to see what your praise manifests. And, um, yeah. and then you jump to um, verses 21 through 22, when Michael confronts David on his behavior. Um, I love how David tells her off. Um, he says, it was before, <laughs> it was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father, or anyone from his house. So he was basically saying, Hey, your dad didn't choose me to be King. God chose me to be King. Um, from house, when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people, Israel, I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this. Um, if you remember the story, he was like in his pajamas dancing in the streets before the ark of the Lord. Um, and I will be humiliated in my own eyes. I don't know how willing you are mm -hmm. to like humiliate yourself like it's easy to humiliate others in public, but are you willing to be undignified and humiliate yourself um, in in your praise of everything uh, the Lord has done? 
you know, like I had written something down before I started, you know, I, I, I wrote, he woke me up this morning. If he never did anything else, that is still more than I deserve. Everything is a gift from him. My life, the air I breathe, my righteousness comes through Christ. You know, I mean, all of that, I mean, everything is a gift. And if that is not worthy of praise, undignified praise, like you gave me today. I mean, right. You know, you don't have to, you don't have to do anything else for me, but you woke me up. Do you know what I mean? I do. Just, I do. Ah, uh, it's such a massive revelation that when you get that, it, it's just, it requires, in my opinion, this deep revelation requires undignified praise. I mean, the, the leaping and, well, and you know, it's not in my nature to be leaping and dancing, but my gosh, when that revelation gets a hold of you, you can't help it. Just like jump up, throw shoes, whatever, you know, <laughs> throw shoes. <laughs> I don't know. Can't we throw something nice like Rice Krispie Treats or something? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> oh, man. No, when you were talking, um, I want to get back to the gifts in a minute, but just something you were saying earlier, um, you know, you know, certainly right after my, my dad passed, I was like in such a, a loss because it was very sudden and... Uh, <laughs> Lori, it's in my nature too. So I just can't wait to get together with you again. So we can really just celebrate this craziness. Like, it's just going to be too fun, yeah. too fun. And we have to do it like when we have like extra days on the outside of a conference. So we're not constantly just going to stuff like we need to just have fun on the outside of that. Yes. So like stand on a corner and, and be dressed like those wavy men, maybe I don't know. So um but it was very difficult to even adjust to what we were considering to be our new normal, but yet to even picture when that new normal would take place. And so I guess when um, the joy would hit me was in the midst of the trauma of re realizing that it be could be quite some time before I actually really truly do experience joy. So, um, so see Suzanne, we have to get together with you too. Yep. So, you know, <laughs> I didn't like my new normal. And I just kept saying, I literally, like, these were my words. I can't wait till spring 2015. I can't wait till spring 2015. Because this happened in fall of October 2013. And so I thought, well, of course, these holidays are going to be horrible. And then next year is going to be the reality hits because they'll be the first real holidays because we're going to still be kind of in this, like, shock at the, at these holidays. So maybe by the next spring, when it starts to warm up, I might start feeling a little normal. And so besides having, you know, my family, which my girls were, were great to bring me joy, you know, it was hard because mom was so in such a, a play. I mean, she was with dad for the first time in 30, 47 years. And to see that, um, you know, he would throw me little joy bombs that's from a Bible study and I wish I knew the lady's name, but it's all about joy bombs. If you, you know, Google joy bombs, um, there's a Bible study about it. I wish I knew the lady's name. Um, but he would through little, through hope of what I would see, you know, come to pass and whether it was in this lifetime or in our salvation in the new earth or, you know, all the, and when we come to that point, I knew that I would receive, joy. So I would have these brief moments of joy waiting for my new normal to start because it just seemed like it was not coming. But all of that being said, you know, if, you know, you were talking about it being such a gift, even waking up today being a gift. Yeah, Kim, um, Mother's Day and Father's Day, definitely. Father's Day is very, very difficult. Um, my dad's birthday is always like the day before the day after. And then my parents' anniversary is like a week later. So it's just like, geez. Um, you know, I was thinking earlier, when you think of Christmas birthdays and even just because occasions when we give or we give to others in need by sowing seeds, volunteering or giving of our time and resources, we receive great joy from giving. So God gives us 
even the gift of today, or he gives us the gift of these joy bombs, or he gives us, you know, so many gifts every single day that his joy is abundant and overflowing from him. And that's where we receive it. It's comp it, it is everlasting and it's continuously flowing out. There are so many um, scriptures in the Bible that talk about not just his joy, but his everlasting joy that it and his abundant joy that it is an ongoing thing and that's because it comes from this endless fountain of joy because he's constantly giving to us so wouldn't he constantly be filled with joy you know anything that the enemy takes away from us he restores anything you know that um i, I lost my train of thought because i started to read a comment but that's okay um you know, so I, so then I started to think about, you know, the giving of grace to one another and how in different relationships um, and in just in many different occasions, whether it's in our, in our workplace or in our friendships, in our marriage, um, giving grace to one another is another thing of giving that's giving and that will allow us joy. And then that kind of brought me to the point of, um, you know, I've talked several times about mine and Marty's walk and, you know, I've alluded to what's happened, but I haven't really talked too much about it. And I'm not going to get in depth detail here because I don't want to run out of time. You know, I think we're going to do that at a later date in May anyway, but, um, you know, a lot was taken away from our marriage and, and, um, I was in a very, very dark place for some time. And looking back on it, I saw the grace that was given in, in the darkest place. And that allowed for his abundant gift of joy to come back to us in, in great measure. Um, I wrote down, God, grace is God's love in action. And God's love brings joy. When we are able to respond in grace, we activate our faith in God's control over our situation. And, you know, although mine ended up in the favor that I, I prayed for and I wanted, but, you know, even when we want restoration and we're believing for it, you know, and talking about that gift of giving grace, we must realize that sometimes the other party has to be willing to receive that gift, to receive that grace. And so that means they must acknowledge, you know, that they need the grace that you're willing to give them. And so there are times when one refuses to see their faults and they don't want restoration. Um, and so even when we pr pray for it fiercely, it may not be attained. So, you know, in that I've seen, you know, even in, in court with the boy that killed my father, offering him the grace of forgiveness and hugging him in the marketplace, you know, I was giving grace to someone that necessarily did not deserve it. He wasn't necessarily going to turn around and, you know, improve his ways. Um, and he didn't, but I was giving it to him freely. And, you know, if we continue to offer that grace as a gift, it might not be life changing in the way that we intended it, but because we receive and reflect joy in offering it, it will be life changing for all of those watching it and I, watching us. And I think that's where you were talking about something similar earlier, where everyone around us will see the reflection of joy that we are giving out when we are giving God's grace. Um, you know, I don't know. Did you have anything in there that you wanted to throw? I was going to yeah, go there... into that Nehemiah joy of the Lord, but um yeah, you know, I mean, when Michael saw David praising, you know, undignified, um, she still witnessed something. And I think there's a lot to be said that even though others may despise you for your praise, they can't deny the seed of what they witnessed. You know, I just, I, I fully believe that everything that we say and do is like, scattering seeds everywhere to everyone that's watching and they may not understand what you're saying and doing at the moment but there was a seed that was planted that the lord's gonna yeah. you know use 
you know, other people or other situations or even more encounters with you encountering and fertilizing and watering that seed, you know, so she may have despised David in her heart. And of course there were consequences for that, but, um, she still witnessed it. And I just mm -hmm. felt like that, that was very powerful there. Um, that sometimes I think we reserve ourselves, um, and we don't allow ourselves to become undignified um, because of the onlookers. And and really, I've been convicted of it myself very much so lately of if I'm withholding myself, if I'm withholding my praise, if I'm withholding what I feel the Lord's saying, who am I robbing of those seeds? Who is right. watching everything I'm saying and doing that I would be witness to what the Lord is doing in my life. And, you know, and, and so it, it, they may think you're crazy, but there's something about the witnessing. You know, I talk, you know, we talk to our kids a lot about, you know, watching your eye gates and your ear gates, you know, what you, things you see, you can't unsee, you know, like I tell my oldest garbage in garbage out. Um, you know, so it's like, if, <laughs> if you're getting other people, good things to see you know what the lord does with that is so much more above and beyond what you can even think ask or imagine and um you know and i think about in that witnessing what chains are broken not only off of you but off of the other people that are watching nothing gets broken in our comfort zone nothing gets broken all that well um in our quiet and reserved whispers you know chains get broken um prison doors get flung open with prayer praise shouts yeah do you know what I mean? and you know and if we really want to free ourselves of our own boggy flesh <laughs> and and other of all the things that bind and hold them up we have to be willing to be undignified. We have to be, you know, like I've said it a lot to the Lord. I'm like, I will be a fool for you. You know, Absolutely. I don't care. I'm a fool. I will continue to speak about your goodness despite this and this and this. I will always say, because what you say is true. Your promises are, are going to manifest. Your words don't fall flat. Do you know what I mean? So I will call me a fool. You know what I mean? So all of the onlookers, whether they despise you, whether they gossip about you, they can't unsee, they can't unhear what they just witnessed and let the Lord, you know, manifest well, that I, contagious seed. I think when, if we, if we're willing to put out there when we're upset or angry or um, grieving or mourning, if we're willing to put all of those things out there, then we need to be willing to also put out there when we're filled with that joy, even when it comes in the weirdest of times and the weirdest of places. And, you know, shortly, you know, I, I don't know if I've talked about the timing of everything that happened in my marriage, but, you know, Marty's depression kind of progressed over a few years prior to um, when it escalated. And so we're talking like maybe a month out after my uh the death of my father and you know marty's depression then sunk deeper of course i was i was con I, I was concentrating on my family but i was also very busy concentrating on my mom at the time and so his loneliness and depression of feeling constantly alone in his life because he had boxed himself into this place of feeling alone even though he was surrounded by many others um he was not you know in a, in a very good place to, um, you know, realize that what he had around him could pull him out of that place. And I think, you know, when, when we can show others, um, you know, not me, not really realizing where he was either, I didn't know what to do. So when I think, you know, of the joy of the Lord as, as my strength, I think the more that we share, you know, the strength that we get from God in these moments, mm -hmm. you know, the more that we can help others realize how tangible it is to tap into. 
and I'm sorry it's taking me a while to kind of get this out. I kind of struggle with how to how to talk about it. But um, you know, when I think of the joy of the Lord is my strength, I think of um, that that which was one of my toughest battles. And although, you know, I no longer have flashbacks that cause, um, you know, anxiety. Um, just the memory of the pain that I felt can still make me shudder, you know. And although I don't necessarily relive that pain, um, my heart aches for anyone that suffers from it. And so with that, I just hope that the joy that is felt like instantaneously, like when you ask God for it in those moments that people really truly call out his name, because, you know, this was an earth shattering pain. It, one that just like rippled through every fiber of my being. I felt like I was mourning the physical loss of my husband that day. And, you know, what I'm alluding to is the fact that there was major betrayal in my marriage. There was infidelity and it wasn't planned for any physical satisfaction. It was from a very dark place of being alone. And so, you know, here I was grieving over my marriage that in that moment I felt was lost, you know, so being in this very dark place, I cried out to God, you know, and I literally was in bed for two days. I would say over 48 hours and just crying, just in a very, very dark place. And if I really get seriously, you know, honest here, because I had drinking issues from my depression years before that, I drank some of those 48 hours because it took the pain away. But then in, when that time ended and I could kind of just like reach up and cry out to God, he literally filled my spirit with this hope and hope is such a seed of joy and he wrapped his love around me and his and joy is birthed from his love you know and so here I was you know um sorry <laughs> everything turned around and there was this hope for restoration there was new life given to both Marty and me and as crazy as it sounds I find joy in my story because of God I survived my marriage survived and we are happier and stronger than ever and I think that's where I don't know if you said this already but I know that we we talked about it that joy shifts things you know and and it does I mean it truly can shift an entire atmosphere and the outcome of it and again you know that comes from a gift from God when it can happen. Um, you know, I was going to go on to my Zephaniah. I didn't know if you had anything you wanted to throw in there. I don't want to keep talking if there was something that came to mind. No, no you can go ahead. <clears throat> um, you know, one of our, our scriptures that we base our ministry on is the Zephaniah 317. And I, 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 just adore that scripture because back in 2012, this was kind of like an early point in Marty's depression and it kept kind of surfacing. And we went to see a therapist back then because he was kind of just seeking any approval from anyone. And even though he had my approval and he had, you know, the adoration of his children and his parents, he didn't feel it because somehow we were all connected to the loss that he experienced when um, things didn't work out well and financially for us through past business partners and things like that. So when he was first going through, well, I, again, it was midway through a point of depression and he was in the point of possibly leaving us talking to someone else just to get that like feeling of I'm accepted. I'm, I'm, what's the word I'm looking for? I'm successful, whatever, because you can tell anybody anything and they believe it. So, you know, while he was going through all that, I was crying out to a teacher at work who said, you know, the scripture of Zephaniah 317 over me that he will sing over us and there will be joy and victory. And at the time that was back when I was first learning scripture, I didn't understand how much this scripture would mean to me later on in my life. And if, if you know my story, victory was brought in my marriage on March 17th. How crazy is that? 
um, when this other woman called me to give me the gruesome details of what went down. And I literally thought I was going to collapse and die in the moment. But God quickly, within those 48 hours, turned my weeping to joy and gave me victory. So now every March 17th, instead of weeping, you know, and what was lost on that day, you know, even in the fact that we were restored, there's still that day, just like the day we lost my dad, that we come upon that I could experience great loss in remembering it. So now I actually celebrate that day. And I'm very happy because it's St. Patrick's Day. It's also someone's birthday. So <laughs> I still get to experience joy on that day. Um, but just some notes, if I can share them that I wrote down, you know, we were talking about earlier, we will no longer, um, you know, sometimes we have shame. Sometimes people call us different names, um, different things happen. So I kind of broke down um, Zephaniah 3 a little bit when he talks about the day of hope. And if you look at 311, um, we no longer, it says, we will no longer be ashamed. He will remove all proud and arrogant people from among us. There will be no more haughtiness. So those people that are acting proud, those people that are arrogant, those people that look down on us for our walk, or those people that caused our walk and our pain, that aren't, you know, asking for forgiveness um, and receiving grace and all of that, you know, God will remove them. He will remove, he will either remove them or he'll remove their arrogance in one way or another. So, you know, this is important in our walk because people assume things happen you know, for a common reason. So for me and Marty, they don't understand that it is a place that when you're in a place of this depression, one can make wrong decisions and bad things can happen from those wrong decisions, but it's coming from a place of needing acceptance, coming from a place of needing, you know, approval. Mm -hmm. Someone in Marty's life always said, you know, you should have been a surgeon. Well, in one ear, you can hear that as you're so smart, like you can do anything. But in another ear, you can hear, oh, I'm just a plumber. That person thinks I should have been a surgeon. Why am not, I not a surgeon? So, you know, it's not always temptation to have a physical desire met, but to have an emotional need met um, or to have that chemical imbalance briefly overturned with the chemical release of that act, you know, um, bringing those good feelings that can become addictive to feel better, you know, like alcohol or drug. And that makes me think like so many people want gratification through alcohol, drugs, sex to get joy or to be happy. And none of that brings you true joy. Joy, It's not the everlasting joy of the Lord. You know, when we receive the everlasting joy of the Lord, it, 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 it doesn't just stop when the, the chemical release in the brain stops. It doesn't just stop when the buzz wears off. It is everlasting and we can walk in it, you know. Um, you know, he goes on in 3.9, and I just want to bring this up. I had X'd it out earlier. But I just wanted to bring it up because we talked a little earlier. Three nine, he will purify the speech of all people, um, so that it is pure is a is a blessing in advance. Someday there won't be those who mock and ridicule us. So all the words coming from our lips will be pure. And I think about those people that will someday repent for what they've done, and they too will have good words coming from their mouth. And that just gives me great joy because I know that there will be a grieving in that for, for some that they will realize what, what they had done and, and will all receive those pure words that we're all seeking. Um, so anyway, you know, for me in all of this, this was a time that um, I could have shut God out. Both of us could have. Marty could have been ashamed. He could have been wanting to remove God from his life, you know, because of that guilt and shame. I could have been angry with God. Like we talked about earlier, you know, I was angry. I was super angry and I was angry for a long time, you know, with several people and several things, you know, um, but I could have been angry with God and I could have completely shut him out. So, you know, Zephaniah um, points out in 314 through 318 that gladness and joy results when we allow God to be with us. 
And thankfully, both Marty and I fell to our knees before the Lord. Marty was overwhelmed, you know, probably on the third night out, out of this revelation. He was overwhelmed by the Holy Spirit and delivered from his depression and pride. So knowing it would be, you know, Marty's deepest desire to follow God's commands, God rejoiced over us um, with singing. And for me too, you know, here I was self-medicating those days. I went back to something from several years previous to, to drink. And I had like turned away from that and said, no, no way, you know? Um, so to feel that kind of joy, we must draw closer to it, you know? So to kind of wrap this up, it goes on in 315 and 16. The Lord, the Lord will live among you. Don't be afraid for the Lord. Your God is with you. Here's 17. His power gives you victory. The Lord will delight in you. And in his love, he will give you new life. He will sing and be joyful over you as joyful as people at a festival. Who would think that joy could come from something so painfully devastating? I was in that place of crying out, you know, as you said, and I was in bed for those 48 hours, I never thought joy could be ever felt again. And although I had not shut that out, I had not let him into my pain. When I did, I felt hope being birthed and new life ready to burst forth. So, you know, I just think about even when things don't turn out the way that we want them to, even in the loss of our parents, even when, you know, things don't turn out the way we want to and we don't want the new normal that greets us every day that when we allow him to fill us with joy in those moments they become we begin to feel the joy more and more as as we step into it you know we might not understand it we might not believe that it's something that we should be putting out there but have you ever seen someone, you know, I, I know so many people who've lost children and it's so devastating and you see them actually walk in joy later in their life. And that's given to them as a gift from God to allow them to be able to do that. You know, it's, it's just beyond our own understanding. It's, it's just like the peace that he gives us, you know, mm -hmm. And I was going somewhere with that. And I'm kind of just, <laughs> I won't say I'm out of words, but I'm just kind of out here <laughs> in a bubble. So I apologize for that. I just kind of didn't mean to go all there, but, um, you know, I think it's, it's, it's something to share those places when we're down so far that we don't believe that there will ever be joy again. And now there's such joy in every day. You would think that so soon after words that there couldn't be joy, but there were, was even, even when I would scream out and yell in Marty's face, you know, months and months into that, or we would be crying to one another, we still found joy in those days. And then eventually God brought us into the business that we're doing and we spend every day together and we crack up laughing all the time. I mean, there's true joy spent, not just, you know, this joy that we feel within, but just like laughing out loud and we're ridiculously stupid with it. And I <laughs> want it to be out there. And, and I think that even gives me more of a reason to want to tell people um, about our testimony, because I want them to see the pain that we walk through, but I really want them to see this crazy joy that we walk in. And there's, yeah. you know, Brenda, Brenda's on here and Brenda can attest for my craziness and Marty's too. So <laughs> we're truly crazy. So yeah, I am sitting here and I just realized I apologize if anyone was commenting, I flipped the screen where you can't see the comments. And I literally sat here going, Sarah's not commenting. <laughs> Suzanne's not commenting. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> And it was so that I uh, could get this joy later because I'm sitting here going, holy cow, like, oh my gosh. <laughs> so sorry about that. I didn't mean to ignore comments. I literally accidentally flipped the screen. So 
So, you know, I want you to, power. if you have anything, go ahead. Um, I mean, to, to come off of that, I, I really, <laughs> like, how do you, how do you end with that? I mean, it's just so powerful, you know, I mean, it's just, it, it's so powerful because I, I've witnessed through my life multiple places where there's just been absolute devastation and yet the Lord is faithful to come through with his joy and his restoration in everything. And, um, you know, I mean, the only th things I had left was, you know, after David's praise, you know, God sent Nathan to speak to him about his promise. And yeah. I think there's a lot to be said about that. You know, when, as I was doing, as I was reading this and writing it down, I felt prompted to find out what the meaning of Nathan's name meant. And oh, yeah. it means gift. So the Lord sent a gift to deliver David's promise to him. Another gift, you know, and it just, it just totally blew me away. It totally blew me away. It just, his goodness absolutely leaves me in awe and speechless, like all the time. All and that gift of Nathan to David, what did that ultimately bring? Um, joy. Yeah. <laughs> Eventual joy. And yeah. And what yeah, transpired and in the days, weeks, years, months. <laughs> To come. And it was, I mean, generational too, you know, I mean, it, it was exactly. talking about, you know, it, it's, it's all, it's always generational. Everything that the Lord does, it's not just for us and our immediate um, purpose and our immediate situations. It's, it's the trickle effect of what happens to me is not going to happen to my kids and my grandkids and my great grandkids and so on and so forth. And that's what this whole thing with David, I mean, you know, the Lord, you know, he dwelt in a tent, he dwelt in a building, you know, throughout the whole, you know, Old Testament. And then, you know, Jesus comes and now, you know, he lives within us. And I just couldn't shake the thought, the thinking about that, you know, doing that kind of correlation of Old Testament versus, you know, Old Covenant versus New Covenant is probably the better words I, I like to use. You know, like, if the Lord did all of these promises and all of these things in the old covenant, how much more does he do for us now? And I just think, you know, our, our own testimonies are someone else's prophetic promises. They're, they're, they're that joy and bombs. Like you were saying earlier, like yeah, people are going to get set free listening to your testimony. Do you know what I mean? Like how many people yeah. are going to get set free? Um, just by sharing that and and you know this whole you know raw and real thing it's like people want to hear the humanity they don't want to hear the you know the preaching <laughs> you know and exactly you know yeah i mean i was a broken mess i was you know i i was just a disaster for most of my life you know one bad choice this and that and the other and you know, but the Lord's redemption and, and healing and all of that stuff comes in. And, and so when you talk about it, I mean, you can't lose your humanity in sharing about the Lord. You've got to be able to say, yeah, this is where I was. And now look at where he's brought me and, you know, and he's given me joy in place of my pain and in place of my um, yes. humiliation, he gave me humility, you know, um, in place of my loneliness, he gave me um, just communion with him. And, and he surrounded me with people that fill in those voids of all of those who left me high and dry because they couldn't deal with my mess kind of stuff. And, you know, and I just, I struggle with, um, you know, kind of back to what we were talking about that, that, re you know, if David was reserved with his praise, you know, he would have stayed, you know, he would have still been married. I mean, he still was married to her, but, you know, he showed her truth, <laughs> you know, his undivided yeah. praise 
showed him who she really was. She was carrying the spirit of Saul, not, not God, you know, in their marriage. Yeah. You know, I was, there were consequences to her um, confronting him that way, but I don't know. I, I just, uh, he just leaves me in awe. I, I just, I love hearing, um, me too, Suzanne. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Me too. Um, yeah, I, I can't even. Well, I think can't even go all, the, all of the stuff. Um, but yeah, definitely. You know, some shame was a big one. Some of the joy bombs in in, you know, my walk with coming out of you know, I can name a million with my dad. I think I have done some on some previous past where there were little joy bombs. But some of the joy brought to us is when he shows where he um, exactly can look what he has done for sure, Amy. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, when we, when we look at God's hand in our life and, you know, this is a huge um, testimony that's, you know, for me to give like mine and Marty's full testimony that covers the span of our marriage, it would take me literally hours. So I'm not going to do that to you. But when you look at little things that pop up that God gives you revelation in and you're like, whoa. Okay, so yeah. really quickly. So this was the 17th year of my marriage. Looking back, Marty grew up on 1717 Tarleton Way. Okay, well, I grew up in 19717. Literally, it took me two and a half years to realize that 197 equals 17. And then my house number was 17. So I also grew up on 1717. Okay. Then we, our first home was on 333 Cove Road. So I feel like he had, like God said, I have put you together. I want you to stay together. This is why I brought you through this. Our first home was 333 Cove Road. So looking back, I see that God initially put us under the wing of his protect, protection, you know, and we were his, you know, and he would fight for us. Oddly, Marty woke up at 3.33 every night for a year of the year and a half of this betrayal, right? Crazy, right? He had that revelation in Nate and Christie's for sound class. So then we go on to, Sarah, this one's going to really get you. The place <laughs> that the betrayal happened was at a place of work, which was on the address of 333 Mill Street. So can we say that he was still under God's protection. So was our marriage, but he was put through the mill and Marty was refined. So when he came out, it was just all gold. Yeah. So, I mean, I can go on for there. I have like things listed and listed and listed of just the craziness. And it was our 17th year of marriage that it was restored on March 17th. So it's, it's just so good. Like, I just love when he is able to show up and show us the gift in each thing. Like just looking back at Nathan's name, you know, yeah. And, and seeing that, that when we, when we unwrap things, literally unwrap them and see, you know, and there's no coincidences that my good friend Brenda Cham right there walked me through so much that year and we became friends through that <laughs> so um you know if i go back real quick to zephaniah um he he goes on to give further hope in 318 to 320 this goes back see there were so many things about this that just everything we keep talking about i just wish we could be like talking in unison and still understood like where is that like like we're supposed to be able to do eventually in the spirit, right? Right. So he tells us he will not allow us to be disgraced. Um, you know, so for me, sharing our true walk, you know, um, there is that worry of being disgraced. And it caused, it, it caused me to have fear. But I feel like we're like three years out of this. And I don't want to walk in that fear anymore. And I listen to God's words when he says, I, he will not in Zephaniah 318 to 20. So I'm walking right now in three, eight, you know, I'm walking in 18, right? 2018 to 20. And I'm looking at his scriptures of 18 through 20 and sharing this 
can cause a fear of insult, accusation, and slander. God will not allow that, and he will deal with those that feel superior enough to react in disdain. He will severely deal with all those who oppressed us or will oppress us. He will not not defend us, you know, and we will see those things happen, you know, and just to give everyone a little piece of hope out there, you know, God, um, what's the word I'm looking for, Amy? When he, um, what is the word when he makes things right? I say it every day, all the time. He will vindicate us. So we don't even have to pray for certain things to happen. They just happen. So that little person was fired. And even more recently, somebody else was fired from a job where they harassed me about my father's court case. And I'm just like, who are you going to fire next, God? I had nothing to do with this. I walked away. I never spoke to any of these people. I never talked to them. I never, you know, blew accusations on them. I never threatened. I just like walked away. And um, he vindicates us, whether that person realizes where it came from, you know, and so I always walk with, you know, the person that um, initially put us through the experience of losing everything, you know, I'm already eventually um, filing bankruptcy and stuff. I believe that, you know, there will be vindication there too. And, you know, hopefully, you know, for those people that call people names and bully us and say horrible things, you know, hopefully there's a realization and we don't ask for it so that they are, you know, gosh, I cannot think of any big words persecuted for it tonight. That was not the word I was going to, but thank you, God, for giving me that one. You know, we don't want them to be persecuted, but we want them to come to the revelation so that their life is eventually changed, even if it doesn't affect our life eventually because they're so far out of it. We want them to have that aha moment so that they too can experience this joy that we're talking about. You know, I'm not greedy. There's enough to go around. It's abundant and overflowing, right? So. Yeah, I think that's the big thing. You know, I mean, you can, you can sit and say, you know, I I regret all of this stuff about my life. and, And I've had this conversation with my husband a lot. It's like, you know, I could sit and wallow in regret but I'm having a hard time regretting something that brought me to a place where the Lord is able to heal me back to who he originally created me to be that life and my bad choice is corrupted. Do you know what I mean? It's hard to, I mean, even though, you know, people could have gotten clobbered or whatever, it's hard to fully regret. I regret pain or whatever, but it's hard to fully regret when you know those choices brought you to him and, and that's the whole, you know, he, he taking the beauty and turning or the ashes and turning it into beauty and, and, and restoring um, my mourning into joy. And um, I mean, he's just amazing, <laughs> you know, absolutely. It, it's, it's, what would life be like if, if, you know, maybe you didn't go down that path? Well, I don't know, probably still good, you know, cause he's good and he's got good plans for you. Um, but what he Amen, does Suzanne. After our life. Um, yeah, exactly. And, and that's, that's the big thing, you know, um, you can, you can lose everything, but the Lord, he absolutely restores everything back to better than it was before. You know, so if you lost everything, you get, you know, you're down here when you lose it all. But when the Lord gets his restoration involved, it's here. And, you know, and he, you know, he's created me and restored me back to who he originally had planned. You know, I just didn't know it. I didn't see it because I was so broken, you know, through Mm -hmm. just life, you know, life was really brutal to me and I fell into it a lot and got chewed up and spit (laughs) a lot. Um, but he's just, he's just that amazing. And, you know, and I, 
I was reading, I had a couple of other notes, but I wanted to just kind of wrap it up with this. Um, so after Nathan brought David God's promises to him, David then sat before the Lord. This is in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 18. And he had, um, he prayed praise and thankfulness. And down in verse, verses 28 and 29, this is what just settled with me. He says, O sovereign Lord, you are God. Your words are trustworthy. And you have promised these good things to your servant. Now be pleased to bless the house of your servant, that it may continue forever in your sight. For you, O sovereign Lord, have spoken and with your blessing, the house of your servant will be blessed forever. You know, I think Amen. about this. I think a lot of times we could get wrapped up in, you know, in our, our material needs or, or whatever. But back to what I was saying earlier, he woke me up this morning. If he doesn't do anything else, that was more than enough. He gave me the day to, to leave a lasting generational legacy. And, and that's what I see. And that's what I hear and what I feel when I, your words are trustworthy. The Lord promised David all of these things. Well, look at what all the Lord has promised me, has promised me. What has all the Lord promised you? If he said it, he will do it. His words are trustworthy. His promises will come to pass. And, and that, you know, the one thing I have definitely learned in all of my struggles and losses in this life is that our life should be a legacy for those that stay after us. And what Amen. are we leaving? them with are we leaving them with the the depth of love and revelation that the lord has has given us while we're living you know that's what i want to pass on on my kids it's not you know house and inheritance and all this stuff their their inheritance needs to be multi-generational as well and that is the wisdom and the love and and the joy of the lord um and just the revelation of who god is that all of this stuff is just fleeting and fading faster than you can imagine. And, um, you know, and that's just kind of my latest awakening, you know, after losing my dad a few months ago. So, you know, it's just, I, I just, that's been my mindset, generational and legacy. And what do I, what do I, what have I done today that if I don't get to wake up tomorrow, what is what have I left with others to Amen. to receive from my life? Yes, Amen. And I just you know speaking of like the loss of your dad and and mom and mine and all of our losses um, that just brought Jeremiah thirty one thirteen. I will turn their mourning into gladness. I will give them comfort and joy instead of sorrow. That's one of my favorites. I just absolutely love that. And, you know, even looking back on that whole Zephaniah thing, in the end, this message, you know, began in doom, you know, and in the end, it became a message of hope. And although our eternal hope is set in eternity, our joy is now. He's not right. making us wait for that joy. We actually get to experience that here. And it's, you know, our choice to accept that we are able to and, and, and to accept that joy, the gift of joy from him. You know, we often see people that, that because they don't understand it, that they don't want to accept it. Mm -hmm. and, and those are the people that we really want to reach out and take hold of and give God's love to them. So then they see that love and then that joy is experienced. Um, 
he kind of given me when I was in my quiet time, just talking to him about joy. And I was just asking him, you know, how can I express, um, you know, your joy to others? And I, you know, and basically what I, what I heard him say was my joy is abundant. It overflows from eternity with everlasting supply for all those who surrender to it, leaving behind, casting aside their temporary emotions of fear, anxiety, and turmoil. My joy knows no boundaries. It cannot be contained, limited, or cut off once it has been tapped into. My joy is addictive. You will never want it, want it to leave once you, it fills your spirit. It is the anchor of hope that fills your spirit, even in the darkest of times. It is a life raft that will keep your head above the waves in any storm. My joy is a perspective seen through the lens of my spirit. It can transform the worst case scenario into my plans for you. My plans are to redeem and restore you. When you invite me into your pain, my love for you causes my joy to well up inside you. As it is brought to the surface, it will become contagious as others are moved in your presence. They will then seek the source of your joy. They will then seek me. Joy is the seed to new life for many. My joy will burst forth and break through and shine my light on your circumstances. Just as the seed causes life to rise above the darkness of the soil into the light of day. My love is what I freely give. My unending joy is what is produced in that love. And then he went on to say, scatter my love and reap joy in return. That's so good. And, and that, that and that's what, you know, that's what I want to wake up every day for. And when you're talking about that multi-generational thing where we're passing down and what, what can we do in this day? That's what I want to do. I want to scatter his love so that others can experience the gift of his joy. And, you know, if that requires us to give grace, when we give love, then that's what we have to do. Yeah. Yeah. That kind of goes back to what we were saying at the beginning, of, you know, the people that you don't know are watching that are watching you are receiving seeds of witness based on what you're saying and doing in your life. And, and what is that going to manifest in their lives that they don't even know? And, yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. That's, I was reading Sarah's comment. Yeah, I wanted to get back to that. I saw something come the, up. The generational thing, it's so powerful. Um, there's there's a lot to be said with that. And, and it's that um, drawing the line in the sand saying, no more. I'm going to be mm -hmm. a pioneer for my family when it comes to this, this, and this, and this. Nothing from this is ever going to follow you know, and that's what your, your grandmother did. She said, no more. And, and I think that was really powerful, Sarah, that you said that she chose to forgive um, the unthinkable. And, you know, and I think sometimes some of us have to approach those unthinkable things and we have to choose that forgiveness. Um, you have to choose that without ever receiving an apology because, you know, sometimes those apologies they don't think they've done anything wrong. They don't feel convicted by their choices. They just, you know, because they're either playing the victim game themselves um, or, you know, justify, you know, justification is the enemy's counterfeit to repentance. And, you know, anytime I hear somebody justifying their choices, um, I pray for them <laughs> because you know, I know that battle justified a lot of things in my life and, and, um, and it wasn't right. You know, like it was the blame game. It was only someone else's mm -hmm. fault, but, you know, in that, in that healing and stuff, it was like, yeah, but you still made the choice, <laughs> you know? So it's, it, it definitely is that it's, it's drawing that line in the sand saying, this is the good that I'm bringing forward. I'm leaving all the bad from past generations behind. I'm forging a new thing for my family. This is what they're going to be able to co go back in family history and say, this is where, you know, Mark and Amy drew the line in the sand and the, our family Absolutely. changed from them forward. Like with you, Sarah, you looking at your grandmother, you can see boom right there that, mm -hmm. you know, 
who has done. And, and it does, it does start with, with that, that conscious act and effort of saying, I'm pioneering all the good and, and the new of what the Lord intends for our family, not what the world or anyone else intended. Um, and yes, it, it definitely, there is always in my, in my experience, in my own life and, and experiences from others that I've listened to, um, it's a forgiveness thing too, because you can't carry, um, the woundedness with you. You know, you can still be hurt, um, by others and situations, but you can't carry the woundedness and, you know, you can still have that hurt doing the forgiveness, loving them because they're a child of God too. So because they're God's kid, you're going to love them. You're going to forgive him because he forgave you and mm -hmm. you don't want to withhold it. <laughs> so, you know, it, I've had to walk this walk a lot and it's painful and it's hard, <laughs> uh, but it's necessary. It's absolutely necessary. And it frees you up so much. Yeah, it, it really is. But you know, th but that's, that's the great thing about God is because when your heart is willing, he gives you the strength to do it. When you're broken, but you're saying, Lord, I'm broken and I'm hurt, but I need your help. He does. He helps. And, you know, it's that, it's that process. And sometimes he makes it quick for you because he doesn't want you to have to linger in it. And um, yeah. he doesn't want you to deal with it anymore because it is painful. So he'll give you that distance and, and, and take you on the path that you're asking him to take you on. Um, but you do have to kind of walk along with some of that and let him slough it off for you. You know, all of this is just bringing to mind, like, you know, how I, I, I'm, I've talked before. We we're both this way. We're both feelers, you know, and we, we feel a lot. So we're very emotional and I've been kind of ridiculed of that in my past. But along with being like someone, you know, I'm not like a very angry person at all, but I will feel, you know, and express, you know, sadness or joy and I'll cry for both, you know, and I'm very outward. I wear my feelings on my sleeve, you know, and I let others know exactly where I am with everything. I'm very, very transparent. I want to be transparent and it bothers me when I'm in relationships with others and I, and I don't feel like I can be transparent because it's not welcomed. And so even in my um, family, you know, we all love one another. We will all say that in certain moments, but I want to, I am someone that wants to express it at all times. I want that, I want that love to be so abundant and outpouring and I want to feel it mutually bef between family members. I don't want to have to wait to say it, to see if I'll get it back. And I know that I'm loved. And this is like, not just from one person or two people. I'm just talking the whole way around, you know? And I just want that so badly. And I know that sometimes people are like, okay, Emery, love ya. <laughs> but, and, and, and I, I find myself sometimes distancing myself because I almost feel that it's unwanted and I need to get over that and just do it anyway. You know, I'll be that person running across the road <laughs> of me. <laughs> Very awkward. <laughs> try. That was like a Saturday Night Live skit or something. I don't know. But, you know, I, I want to break. Sometimes it's just even breaking something as simple as that in our lines. I mean, there's many things I could name that are like, ugh, you know, that I would love to break. But that's just something. I just want people to be able to be comfortable with pouring out their love for one another, you know, or not feeling like they have to place others in a box and maybe I'll get to you over here. You know, it, it's just like, for me, like I want, I find joy out of loving others, Yeah. you know, and dog on it. I don't want them taking that joy away from me. Let me love you. Yeah. 
You know, if I'm not loving on you, then you must be <laughs> doing something to keep me from loving you. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm really emotional too. And then it was, you know, so ridiculed, like, you know, oh, you're reading into things or you're too emotional and you shouldn't be so emotional about this, that, the other. And so I took it to the whole other extreme where I just, you know, like shoved down yeah. every emotion and, and so then I, like, I became so hard, you know, like, nothing phased me. And, you know, ghetto Amy was <laughs> out in full force, you know, because the only emotion you were yeah. to have to stifle all that other stuff is anger. You know, anger is acceptable, but nothing else is. And so then when the Lord got a hold of me, he's like, no, this is how I created you. So... I'm emotional. <laughs> he, you know, I, I cry and tear up over everything. Like I literally could see a stranger in the grocery store crying and I get choked up. My eyes get all watery, you know, but you know, I don't look at it as a negative thing anymore like I used to. And I did for a really long time. I was like, Oh my gosh, why am I so emotional? This is so embarrassing. Now it's just like, you know what? No, this, this is a gift. And I think when you look at it, this is a gift that it's a gift, not just for me, <laughs> you know, it's not just a gift for me because it, every time I feel emotion about something or someone perfect stranger or someone close to me, that shows that I have the heart of God. Because what moves us moves him. Mm -hmm. And that gift isn't just for me in that aspect. It's for others too. You know, and I have learned that so deeply over the last several years. Just, you know, I mean, obviously walking through my own grief over, you know, it'll almost be 10 years since my mom died. Um, and then just a few months for my dad. But just through all of that grief, I can now like come alongside someone and I can weep with them and I'm not looking for mm -hmm. work, you know, cause before I didn't want my emotions to be seen, but those people in those, in that, in that hurt and in that, <laughs> and in that despair or whatever it is, they need to see my tears. They don't need to hear my yes. words. They need to see my tears. So that gift is for me, but it's also for everyone else that's witnessing that, you know, and it, others may call you crying in public undignified. They may call me crying on Facebook live undignified, but I'll be undignified before the Lord using the gifts that he gave me. And so I just, I always encourage others that, you know, if, if you have been given that gift, don't stifle it don't stop. Absolutely. It is so much, there's so much healing that happens, you know, and, 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 and I think it's going to be used more and more. I'm going to get a little prophetic here because I'm really feeling it right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> in this day and age, when everybody is a keyboard ninja or whatever you want to call them, everybody is so quick to just speak and then unplug and and we've become so distracted and so disconnected with others i really see like the lord using those of us he's gifted with that emotion to be reconnecting people like yeah. he wants people's hearts to be moved not not in a in a superficial artificial social media way you know, like a true move of God through, you know, through us sharing his heartbeat that I don't know if I articulated that right, but you know, I, I just, he is moving so much right now. Um, mostly he's bringing healing to his church. And I think, um, we as his church, he's cleaning up and he's, you know, fixing and, and correcting these little things so that he can launch us forward. And, and part yeah. of that is, is regaining some of our humanity because we've become so preachy and I don't want to say judgy, but yeah, I'm gonna, um, <laughs> that, you know, people can't connect. 
and, and we're not connecting because we're so into this, um, I call it Christianese language, you know, that it's just above like normal um, conversation. Like people forget, people forget have a normal conversation. And it's like, no, I want people to, to see my brokenness. I want people to see my sadness over their situation, you know, connecting with people. And I really see this, this big, um, this big shift with people um, that are really just flat out surrendered um, to the Lord, wanting him to move in their own lives, but also wanting him to move through them into others. And a big mm -hmm. part of that is, is the emotion side of things and that, that desire to, um, to connect and to relate um, because that's what it's all about from the very beginning of time until now is how relational God is and, and that's what he needs his church to be and he needs us emotional people to be the forerunners of that. I know that's well, and emotion No, but emotions make us human and, and then that's you know, like that that is the connection um to all of our experiences. And I think, you know, mom and I have always been close, but we were super close in that very emotional period the two years after the loss of my dad, we were super close because I think we could connect in this reality of our emotions. And I think more people would connect and there would not be that horrible void out there, you know, and that's why, you know, I've been very blessed in different workplaces, you know, that uh, my friend Lisa's on here and she worked with me in the nursing home for years. If you, we could cry together, seriously, but we could laugh, I mean, at the dumbest things. Yeah. I, I I don't know. I mean, I, I could just tell you some stories, but we could just laugh. And her laugh is infectious, you know. And so you just connect. And we're connected endlessly. And, and the same with Brenda. Like, I've just been very blessed to have these very emotional feeling people with me where I can feel with them and then it connects you and it's, and it's a true connection that isn't easily broken. You know, people can walk away if they don't share emotion with you and they're void of it. And they just say, Oh, I'm at peace. Everything's fine. And they're not showing who you, tr they truly are to you. Then there is not that connection of your soul and your spirit. And you're not, you know, it's not going to bind you. There's people that, you know, I've spent time in my life very, very, very close to, but it was when they would share those things with me. And then they, <laughs> I won't tell any stories, Lisa. <laughs> I'll tell them of me when I was trying to pretend I was a Japanese teppanyaki drummer. And I told her I just needed a pair of men's. <laughs> What are those boxer briefs? The white, <laughs> not the whitey tighties. They go down a little further. And if you wear those and a men, a large man's shirt and a belt around it, you can look like a Japanese Japanese <laughs> drummer <laughs> from Disney oh, World God. in the Epcot, <laughs> Japan. And then you can play a CD and pretend you are one because it is my dream to actually do this. <laughs> and she was just like, what? <laughs> so that was one of the smallest, dumbest <laughs> ones. But hey, you know, that's funny. See, if Lori was still on here, she would have gotten that totally. Yeah. But yeah, when you don't share emotions or you don't let people into your bubble or your box, mm -hmm. like then they're not going to have a connection. Yeah. You're just not. And I, I believe what you're saying. I believe all us there's going to be this freedom of emotion we are going to free emotions forget deliverance we're just going to go around your emotions are free yeah be free in the name of jesus let your emotions run well and i think also i mean that's it's so true it's going to be a, a freeing up and a releasing but because there's going to be so many of us there's going to be so many more safe places because there's so many people who have been hurt 
like deeply. And I think that's why you have a lot of people with walls up too, because they've been, you know, gossiped about, shamed and all that stuff that, you know, they're, they're terrified to express anything and, you know, all that stuff. But yeah, yeah. it's going to be good. He's, he's definitely going to be, going to be really good. His healing and his joy over everyone, you know, in this, you know, revelation of, of joy and who he is and his goodness. Um, there's just so much that comes out of that, that manifests out of that more so than anything else. Um, so, yeah. I think you're right, Sarah. I think God does. He wants us to be undignified, full stop, whatever that means in Australia. <laughs> no holds barred. <laughs> Who part? Whether we're dancing in our pajamas or crying. Yes, absolutely. And I'm not afraid to be crazy. I'm really, really not. Nope. <laughs> crazy. So crazy crazy. Crazy. That's all about the raw and real, right? <laughs> yeah. You know. Yeah, and you know, just real quickly, you're talking about feeling prophetic. Um, just a little earlier, you know, we were talking about the broadcast and you know, I, I feel like this is going to be someone on the replay, but I just feel like someone that's going to be watching this, um, you know, is feeling lost and abandoned in whatever they're walking through. And they can't remember the last time that they felt joy. And I just want to speak joy over you. And I just want to pray over you. And I want to, you know, I, I want to pray that you will, you know, just whisper the name of Jesus and just ask him for, for him to release his joy over you so that you can be blessed, you know, with that and you can feel his love, you know, wrap you up in, in this place that you're feeling abandoned and lost. And that then as you feel this joy bubble up within you, you'll start to hear his voice more clearly because right now, whatever is going on, you're kind of like blocking it out and, 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 and you're not hearing what he's speaking because you're listening to the lies of the enemy telling you that you're going to stay there in that lost and broken, abandoned place. And I don't want you to believe those lies. I want you to seek the Lord today. And I want you to ask him to shine his light on you and to fill you with that abundant joy and allow him to bring you up. Just like he said, you know, to me earlier to use him as that life raft that will keep you above the waves and he will bring you to land and you will make it out of this place. Allow him to be your guide um, and allow him to give you direction and revelation as to how you can walk forward and out of this place. And, and I pray that many people will come and surround you and let you know that you are loved and adored, not only by him, but those that surround you each and every day. Amen. 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 Yeah. You know, I just pray over everyone here yeah. that, you know, that he will transform your life with more of his abundant joy and that he will allow you to, you know, walk in that joy and let it flow out to the others around you. And tomorrow, let us like all get up tomorrow and just walk in this joy and let, even if people look at us, like we're crazy. Let's give them the joy. Let's give them the joy, the gift of joy. Yeah. We said today, we, Marty and I made a stop and, uh, there was someone that was very, you know, a little pretentious and a little, um, feeling, uh, see the, the words that escape me when I'm on live entitled and, and he needed to, get in front of everybody and be seated because he flew into this restaurant literally in a little tiny plane and he wanted to bump up into the, the line that was waiting for a seat to get something to eat. And so he got his seat and he got a nicer seat. He took our booth <laughs> because he needed it. And I told Marty, I said, Oh, afterwards, I wish I would have thought of this sooner we should have bought his lunch. I mean, all they got was a salad and a sandwich. Wouldn't that have been nice? Here's this rich guy with a plane that flew into this landing strip to have lunch. And someone buys his, someone who he took their booth, because who doesn't want a booth, buys him lunch. Yep. Have some joy. I hope you enjoyed <laughs> my booth. 
Sorry. Were you feeling um, something um, there? Yeah, I was. Elaine, I just I keep hearing right. Um, I saw your name and I just ha heard writing. And as I was just kind of sitting here praying, I, I felt like the Lord was telling you to like start journaling. Um, that he's wanting to give you like revelation and healing through your writing that maybe while you're processing through um, some of this pain, he's going to give you revelation in that. And you're going to go back and you're going to read these words that you wrote down because you're not going to remember some of them. But instantly when you go back and read it, he's going to bring a deep healing to you. Um, so I just, I really felt that strongly um, when I saw your name pop up um, to um, just grab a journal and grab a pen and, and just allow the Lord to just kind of invade your quiet space and just put that pen to paper and, um, and let that happen. Amen. Be ready to wrap up for the night and i will do that sarah absolutely i will do that and i want to thank everyone that was popped on here and stayed on here through all of that um honestly we both thought that you know it was going to be a brief broadcast um that we basically just had this word of joy and uh and that was going to be it. I'm glad to see. Yay. It was confirmation. Oh, that's awesome. Love that's that. awesome. <laughs> so this got a little more long winded and I thank each of you that stayed through, you know, that testimony. It's, it's been something yeah. on my heart that this would be the year that I would need to share that. And, um, you know, there's more to come and more to say and more to talk about it, but you know, this was a nice little baby step for me. And I appreciate my family joining in around me that we're here tonight. So thank you all. Thank you all for listening. Thank you to those friends that I knew when it was all going down and that I called and cried to or, you know, laid on their floor. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Gravy. Love you guys. All right. Love you so much. And we will be back next Thursday, right? Yep. We don't know with what yet. <laughs> Anybody all... gets any downloads, message us. Message us if you get any downloads. We'll be happy to go there. You know, yeah. and always, always feel free to either message us together or message us individually if you want to talk more about something that we brought up. Um, you know, we're always willing to go into more detail with anything that we can um, when we talk later. So please, um, you know, if anybody watching the replay that had to walk through something similar to what I've walked through and, and you need to know the steps, you know, that we walked through to get to where we are, please, you know, be, be sure to message us and ask, cause that's why we want to be here. I love you too, Brenda Chan. She, you know, she is, I am pork chop and she is gravy, pork chop and gravy. And if you knew the story behind that, you know, then uh, you would be dying <laughs> laughing. So, yep, maybe someday, Sarah Wiseman. I don't know. Sometimes he can't stay up late enough. So we'll have to see how that ha if that happens. But that would be cool. And someday you're going to be on here and everybody yeah. else. Yep. As soon as Anne Marie gets good Wi-Fi. <laughs> and can do this on her laptop. If I did, just so you know, everyone, I turn off my Wi-Fi when I'm doing this. Um, I have to, if I was on my laptop, there would be the ability for Wi-Fi to shut down because it goes out and has to be, you know, turned back on frequently. So I would probably lose you 10 times. So I'm not able to do that app where you can invite others on, but Someday they'll get that over here in Boone, Tucky, as my daughter calls it. <laughs> it's actually Boonesboro. So, oh, that's fun. Anybody, anybody that's local that wants to go hear Bill Young speak at the he he goes to church across across the street from Georgia School downtown Hagerstown, but he's actually speaking three miles away from me at Tribe of Judah. Oh, Brenda, can you go to church with me on Sunday? Will you go to church with me? It's at ten o'clock, I think. Ten, maybe 1030. 
let me know. Join me, Tribe of Judah, right next to Greenbrier Elementary School. We'll, we'll blow a ship for a horn. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, man. Um, She's not answering. It did be your request, and, and I will definitely be... Um, definitely be praying for you. Um, yep. I'll definitely be praying for you. I, I haven't had any more downloads for you, but um, I'll definitely be praying and um, can message you if I hear anything. Okay. Love you. And oh, so much for Sarah, jumping on. Sarah said, hi. Oh, hi, hi Abel. Abel. Hi, Abel. We oh, love you, Abel. Abel. We love you, Abel. Uh, Here. This is for Abel. Yeah. <laughs> this is for Abel. Hi, Abel. Uh, open your mouth, please. That was fun. I finally got to use that. <laughs> I finally got to use it. Okay, Brenda. And I am going to come to your church sometime. I'm going to come and listen to you sing. So oh. there. <laughs> All right. We need to wrap this thing up. Yes, we will pray for pray for Philip, Suzanne. We will absolutely yeah. do that. I wish you could record it because I want to hear him. I want to listen to him. Yeah, definitely, definitely, definitely. All right, Suzanne, love you. tell me what. What? Sorry, one more thing. I was just going to say, Suzanne, tell me if if there's a way that I can drive through where you live on my way to Florida without it taking us longer because my kids would scream me <laughs> and yell if it took any longer. But we're probably going down there this summer to see some friends. So anyway, okay, we will finally get off of here. I promise. <laughs> we love you. Love you, guys. Love God. you all so much. We will see you next week. Yes. Talk to you later. Yeah. Bye.